podcasting from the Star Group, home of the iconic Dressable Lions. This is Beyond the Known, the podcast that takes you a step beyond what you know about business. I'm your host, Paul M. Newberger, president of the Star Group. On today's episode of the Beyond the Known podcast, our guest is Amelia Forzak, owner and founder of Pithy Wordsmithery. Amelia is passionate about helping authors write and market their books. As the founder of her organization, she works with clients across a range of industries to help them build their thought leadership and leverage their authorship to grow their businesses. Amelia, nice to have you today. Thanks so much for having me. It's good to be here. Absolutely. So you got to tell me, how did you end up in this line of work? (laughs) It's funny because I always wanted to write books. I always, you know, considered myself to be a writer. Even as a kid, I would like make fake newspapers and try to sell them to people. So I feel like I was always interested in putting words on paper. I have a journalism degree, but after school, I decided to go into marketing because it's interesting and so much of marketing is writing. And my CEO at the time got an offer to write a book and he was like, this is a great idea. It'd be great for marketing, but I don't have time to do this. Who could write this? And I was like, I'll write it. And I just, you know, so it kind of fell in my lap. I realized I loved it and I'm good at it. And it it just sort of went from there. Now, do you have any other writers in your family? Somebody else that maybe might've shared their love of writing with you, or did this just kind of come about organically? My mom is a really good writer. And my uncle's a professional writer. He's a sports writer, which is something that I wanted to be originally. I wanted to go into sports. So yeah, I guess it kind of runs in the family. Now, how long have you been in this business? I mean, professionally, have you been honing your craft for a while now? Yeah, I started my first book, I think about 10 years ago. And that was still when I was working full time for in the corporate world. And I started my business on the side, maybe a couple years after that. And I've just been building it since then. So I've probably written, I'm sort of losing track at this point, I think nine books and then helped with a bunch of others in different capacities like editing or book coaching or something like that. Yeah. And it's interesting. So it's not just quantity. I mean, writing nine books is certainly nothing to sneeze at, not just quantity, but also quality. I mean, among the books that you've ghostwritten includes a New York Times bestseller. That's outstanding. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about that experience and what that meant to you? Yeah, it's funny because that was the first book that I ever wrote. <laughs> so no, it was great. I feel like I've been lucky to work with really intelligent people who are interesting. And that's like one of the things I like the most about my job is that I'm always getting to partner with somebody who's an expert in something and learning about what they do, how they got there. It's kind of like just getting this free education in all these different things. And it's been a ton of fun. Now, help me figure this out. So you obviously do the ghostwriting portion. So let's say a listener to this podcast, I got a great story. I got to share my story with the world. They're on the fence. They're weighing the pros and cons. Maybe I sit down and I write it myself, or maybe I bring someone in like Amelia to write it for me. How do you know which way is the best way for someone to proceed if they're interested in telling their story? Yeah. So I think that everybody gets some help with their book. Like It's not something you should do alone. It just depends on when you're going to bring that support team into the process. Like every book needs help with copy editing and proofreading and that kind of thing. And if you go through a publishing house, they'll provide those things for you. But a lot of times it's really helpful to work with someone earlier in the process and it can save you a lot of time to make sure that you're on the right track and your content is organized in a way that makes sense and is going to make it easier for you to write if you choose to do that. So sometimes I work with people from the very beginning and they like we work together to figure out who's the target market what should we talk about how like what are all the different things that could be in the book what order should they go in and then other times i'll work with people who are like i wrote a book it needs some work and then we see what that looks like from there and sometimes it's a little reworking and then other times it's kind of rewriting the whole thing and moving everything around and untangling ideas so i think if you're a really strong writer and you have time to dedicate to the project, you could totally write your own book, but getting help up front is super important just to set you up for success later. 
And if you're super busy, maybe you have another job, a full-time job, family stuff, travel, it can really help to work with a writing partner so that somebody can just interview you and then they can help get your thoughts on paper. Yeah, and I have to imagine it's one thing to write a book. It's a completely different thing to market a book. And I know that you've got experience in both areas. So now I don't want you to give away your secret sauce. That's why people need to work with you. But can you give us one or two pointers, one or two best practices when it comes to marketing a book successfully? Yeah, I think the biggest thing is starting early. So a lot of times people will be thinking so much about the book that they aren't doing anything for marketing. So maybe they have their own business or they're thinking of launching a business and they think when the book is done, then I'll focus on marketing. Well, if you do that, you're, you know, you're a little late to the game because your book is ready and you don't have an audience who's wanting to buy it. So I think if you start early and you're able to, there's so many different ways you can do marketing, like social media, e-blast, you can do speaking engagements, you can have a website, all these things. Just pick what you like and what you can maintain on a regular basis and just keep that moving. And as you build that up, when your book comes out, that's going to put you in a much better spot for getting the word out there and actually selling copies. So you would probably know this better than most people, just based on the books that you've written, the connections that you have, your knowledge of the industry. Would you say there's a certain type of book or subject matter that is in more demand now than otherwise? That's a good question. It's tricky because the process for writing a book usually takes about a year. So when you start writing it, if you think what's current right now, by the time the book comes out, it's going to be a little bit different. So that part is kind of tricky. Obviously, there's a lot of disruption right now of all different kinds. I did a book on disruption a few years ago, and everything that's happening, I'm like, he's so called that years ago. Like, it's just, it's kind of like an evergreen topic. It's going to manifest in different ways. So I think like, if your book has evergreen content, and it's not tied to a particular moment in time, that kind of helps the books stay relevant for years to come, which is what you're looking for as an author. What type of projects really excite you? Granted, business is business and you've written several books, but if somebody were to call you and say, hey, pithy wordsmithery, I got a great idea for you. What types of projects really excite you and get you going? Yeah, good question. I like the strategy side of it and I like it when people read the books that I work on. So I'm always excited to work with authors who have a platform. So that just means they've got a way of getting the book into people's hands. And it's exciting for me to work on those projects because it really means that our ideas are going to go somewhere and they're going to impact people. So it doesn't really matter so much what the topic is about. I've written about all different kinds of topics. As long as the author really knows their stuff and they're an expert, then they're going to be a great person to work with. And then we know that the book's actually going to help people. It's a huge plus to the project. What would you say to a C-suite executive, business luminary, entrepreneur who is just too humble, just too salt of the earth? Nah, I don't have a story. Nah, I'm not an expert. Nah, nobody would read my book. Granted, it probably depends on a per-person basis, but generally speaking, what would you say to somebody who just doesn't think they have a story in there? It's kind of funny because the people that I work with, sometimes I've noticed like our on one end of the spectrum, right? So they're either really into like ego, look at me, this is going to be great. Everyone's going to love it. Or they're like sort of absent from the storyline throughout. It's like, we're working on the book and I'm like, okay, so how do you fit into this? How are you the expert here? So I think the challenge is always like meeting somewhere in the middle somewhere where you're embracing your expertise because everyone has that, you know? You don't have to be like the number one expert in the entire world to be able to help people. So I think as long as you're able to embrace your expertise and know that you can get your message out there and help people to some degree, you can bring that out in a book. Talk to me a little bit about the importance of storytelling generally, whether it be in sales, whether it be in marketing, whether it be from a social media perspective, somebody just trying to be an influencer. Yeah. Why is storytelling such an important aspect for people to have with respect to their repertoire? I think storytelling is everything. You know, you're basically creating this vision of whatever you want your brand to be or your company to be. 
And that's how your customers are going to think about you. So that's something that you're in control of. And that's a huge part of marketing and sales and just how you interact with people, how you show up. So yeah, storytelling is huge. I know there are lots of books about that and companies are sort of struggling to figure out how to tell their story in a way that resonates with customers. And so, yeah, it's definitely big. You're helping people call attention to their book. You're calling attention to these individuals by highlighting their story. If, if somebody just wants to start calling a little bit more attention to themselves, promoting themselves, kind of igniting their influence, as it were. Mm. Are there some best practices you can offer in terms of how to start calling more attention to oneself? Absolutely. So that's the thing that makes people uncomfortable about marketing, right? They worry that it's going to be, look at me, look at me, kind of this like salesy sort of uncomfortable feeling thing. And it doesn't have to be that. So I think the trick to becoming comfortable with marketing is to come from a point of contribution. So instead of trying to sell something or, or think of it as promoting yourself, think about how you can help people. So your target market, whoever they are, what do they want to know? What are the resources that would help them? What problems are they having? So you really want to sort of like channel them and get into their heads and figure out how you can help them and come up with content that works for those things. Because then you're helpful. You're being a problem solver. You're showing how great it would be to work with you. And all of that stuff is so much more effective than just thinking about it in terms of, oh, I need to promote myself. Does that make sense? If you say it, it makes total sense. <laughs> Absolutely. Can you give us an example maybe of an individual that you're aware of that promotes himself or herself well? Somebody that could be held up as a case study perhaps for others to emulate? There are a lot of people who do it well. I think it probably depends on the medium that you're talking about. Like if you're on LinkedIn, there are certain people who like that's their niche and they're super helpful on LinkedIn. Like other people do videos all the time. Maybe other people are on Instagram. So I think it kind of depends on how you want to consume your content or what medium that you're looking at. But to build a really big following and a following that's engaged where people are commenting on things and sharing, when people have that, they're probably offering a lot of value. So I think if you're always just focused on value all the time, like what can I give away for free? What would help people? Then that's, that's how you do it. Again, this might be a tough question for you to answer, but I love putting you on the spot. How does somebody know if they have a good story? Yeah, that's funny because I talk to aspiring authors all the time. Like over the years, I think I've talked to over 300 aspiring authors on the phone for just, do I have a book or not kind of thing. And for me, so I usually work on nonfiction and it's books that teach people how to do something. So like a business book, a self-help book, like some kind of like how-to book. And the books generally align with people's businesses or their personal brand to some degree. So maybe the book would be one part of the things that they offer or what they teach people. So if you have a business of some sort, you're helping people and you've got knowledge to share. And you're probably sharing that knowledge already through, you know, maybe it's white papers or consulting documents or keynote speeches or something like that. So if you're already sharing knowledge and you have an audience of people who are interested in what you have to say, I think you could definitely have a book. It's just a different medium for communication. Now, what I find interesting about your organization, Pithy Wordsmithery, it's you don't just help authors write their books. You provide several services above and beyond that. Would you mind speaking to that? Yeah. So half of our business is helping with ghostwriting and editing, and the other half is marketing. And that's kind of my background. So it's just funny how they came together because I realized authors really need help with marketing. Like, if you don't market your book, people aren't going to find it, which is super unfortunate because you want to believe that if a book is good, people will automatically read it and it will be successful, but you really have to put a lot of work in for marketing. And so I just had a background in marketing. And when I started my company, we were able to help people with both things. And we found that it really streamlines the process for our authors because we can help with their launch strategy and then also help shape the content of the book around their other, like their whole marketing mix. So if they're planning on doing speaking engagements in the future, 
like, okay, when we write this book, how do we write it so that certain parts of it can be keynotes? Like, how could we have different products or services that tie to the book so they can make more money from their thought leadership in general? Because the copies, when you sell copies, you might make like, what, $5 a copy, maybe $10 a copy if you're lucky. If you go with a publishing house, you're going to make like a dollar or two per copy. So you're not making your fortune through selling copies unless you sell a ton of them. It has to go with other products and services. And so the marketing aspect is huge when it comes to working with authors. So yeah, I like that holistic part of the business. Yeah, absolutely. So for an individual that isn't overly familiar with ghostwriting, writing a book, maybe has thought about it, but has never taken that step. You hear a couple of different terms thrown out from time to time. Yeah. You hear a term self-published or self-publishing versus maybe going to an organization like a publisher for something like that. Yeah. Could you walk our audience through, A, the difference between self-publishing and going through an organization maybe that does that, you know, in terms of being a publisher, but then also how does one know which way is the best way for them? Yeah, that's a good question. So self-publishing used to not be a thing. Like if you wanted to publish a book, you had to get a book deal and go through a publishing house. And that was really prohibitive for a lot of people. And a lot of stories didn't get out there because they weren't seen as like commercially viable. Like if, if they're not going to make a ton of money, a publisher's not going to represent it. That sort of changed over the years. And self-publishing is a really great option for people. And that basically just means that it's kind of like the DIY version of publishing. Whereas if you sign with a publishing house, you have to do a book proposal, you get accepted, they give you a book deal. And then a lot of this stuff is on their terms. They provide some services for you. Like they'll do your cover design, they'll do your editing. They'll, they have say in the title of the book, they'll tell you how much you're going to um, charge for it, when it's going to be released. They manage all that stuff for you, which can be super helpful and great, but it also gives you like a little bit less freedom if you feel strongly about these things and you want to do it a certain way. It also is harder for authors who don't have a big following to get a book deal because primarily publishers are looking like they're in the business to make money. They want profitable projects. They want projects that are almost guaranteed to sell a ton of copies. And if you have a smaller following, you really don't have a chance, a very good chance of getting a book deal with a big publishing house. So a lot of people turn to self-publishing. And as long as you're able to produce a really high quality manuscript with all of the things that a publishing house would normally provide, like get a real artist or graphic designer to do your cover. Don't skimp on that. Get a real professional editor, great proofreader. As long as you're able to do all those things yourself or hire the right, not do them yourself, hire the right people to help you with it, then you'll have the same quality book as a publishing house. From your experience, from your expertise, what characteristics make up a high quality manuscript? A lot of things go into it. I think the overall flow of the manuscript, I think publishing houses are kind of like a quality check, right? Like they'll tell you what's wrong with the manuscript and if it's not good enough, they're not going to publish it. If you self-publish, no one's doing that for you. So it kind of gives you permission to publish like any level of quality that you want. And some authors do just like, they just want to publish a book. They, they're not going to, you know, put in the time and effort to make it perfect. And in doing that, it's kind of messy. Like when you read it, you see there are typos, there are sentences that don't make sense, like things like that. So if you hire professional editors or people who have experience with books, they'll be able to take your writing to the next level so that it's completely polished. Everything looks great, makes sense. Paul, you've recently written a book, you know all of the things that go into it. There's a lot of opportunities for mistakes, like it's a super long piece of content. So just making sure that those things get weeded out and corrected, it's a lot of work. Yeah, absolutely. To say that this is a bit of a process would be an understatement, which is why you need great people on your team, just like you, Amelia. So help me with this then. So if somebody listening to this says, I think I have a story, I think I have something that would sell. I want to go forward and, and write a book and develop this manuscript, etc. Give me three action items that somebody should do. Maybe in no particular order, but obviously we need a roadmap. We need a plan. We need some kind of strategy. Somebody, today's the day I take action. Yeah. What three things should that individual do first? Three things. Okay. 
talk to me. No. <laughs> talk to somebody, Shocker. Yeah, talk to somebody who has experience with books so that you can run run your idea by them, figure out next steps if you're going to work with an editor or ghostwriter or something, and then start making plans for like aligning your brand with the book. So if you want the target market to be for a slightly different audience than what you have now, how do you work your way towards that with your marketing? So it's really about aligning the book with your goals. So thinking really clearly about why you want to have a book, I'd say that's a great place to start too. Like, do you want to book more speaking engagements? Do you want to bring in bigger name clients or charge more or have a new revenue stream, whatever it is, figure out how the book can be a tool for making that happen. So I think it's definitely all about strategy. Another thing is to just believe in yourself and not give up. I know that sounds super basic, but there are so many people who want to write books and some of them do it and some of them don't. It doesn't mean that the people who do it have better ideas or they're smarter, they're better writers, they just get it done. So I think perseverance is a major part of bringing a book to market. Yeah. If you've got that belief in yourself, if you surround yourself with a really good team and you know that, hey, on those good days, don't let yourself get too high. On those bad days, don't let yourself get too low. If you can go through this on a very even keel and not get too emotional about the process. Yeah, it's a lot of work. And I think if you work with a ghostwriter, it's going to be easier for you as an author. It's still going to take some work, but I think that it can be hard emotionally. Like people do question themselves a lot. Like I've worked with a bunch of authors. I think at every point during the process, people are like, does this matter? Does anyone care about this? Does anybody like, is this going to resonate with people? And you just have to get past that. You know, everybody feels self-conscious or they feel like maybe it's not good enough, but it is. If you can help people. And again, coming from that point of contribution of trying to add value to people and like, just help them out, you absolutely have something worth saying. Well, and that was one of the things I appreciated about working with you in this project is, and correct me if I'm wrong, but some days you are more coach than anything else and yeah. not just coaching <laughs> on the literature and the writing, but coaching on the personal side. Yeah. Come on, you can do this. We got to hold you accountable. We got to make sure that we get those edits from you by this time. And to go through this process alone, I can see why so many aspiring authors fall off the wagon because yeah. there's so many moving parts. There's some days that are very difficult. So to have somebody holding you accountable, encouraging you, motivating you, and just giving you another set of eyes I mean, that was worth it by itself, but I'm assuming that with several of your clients in the past, you've had to play the role of coach from time to time, I have no doubt. For sure, you know, and ends up being so much time on the phone because we do interviews for all the chapters. We talk once a week for like a year, maybe sometimes like leading up to the project. And so it does become this like personal relationship where it is like supporting somebody through the project and a little bit like emotionally, like being their cheerleader, cheering them on, you know, it becomes always the project. I am personally invested in their success. Like I want them to be amazing. And I think that people do need to have somebody in their corner like that, who they can talk about, like, does this sound stupid? Does this make me sound bad? Is this confusing? Like you really need to like get in there and like have somebody who's going to be honest with you. I think that's kind of an issue that a lot of people run into, especially like the higher up you get on the totem pole, I think people are less likely to be super honest with you. They're just like, oh, it's great. Yeah, because they, they don't want to say anything else. And then your friends and family love you. So they're going to think everything you do is amazing. So having somebody be a little bit more critical, I think is super helpful for authors. Yeah. Now you've had a decent amount of experience in your young life thus far. I mean, your business is doing well. You've had some very prestigious opportunities and clients come your way over the past couple of years. What drives you, Amelia? Where does your drive come from? Where does your ambition come from? I mean, when you get out of bed to start the day, what is really fueling that success, would you say? That's a good question. I don't know. I've always just been super intrinsically motivated. I just like failure is not an option for me. I want to have everything I do be amazing and I want to work at it. And I guess there's always like that voice in my head. If, it's, if something's like mediocre, it's like, well, why wasn't this better? How can I make it better? And that's just 
that's just like my personality and how I am. So I think that serves me pretty well for being an entrepreneur, just always pushing myself. Yeah, and if you're anything like me, you probably have a difficult time from time to time patting yourself on the back. Just, hey, job well done. I'm proud of this. This was a success. But I'm going to force you to do it because we're going to do a coach role reversal on this one, (laughs) kids. So if you were to look back at your body of work, and again, you've done a lot of good stuff thus far, Mm -hmm. what professional achievement are you most proud of and why? Mm, Good question. I think just having a successful business, like my business has been profitable, like every year I've had it. And I think that a lot of small businesses fail or struggle, like people close, I don't know what the statistic is, most small businesses don't last longer than a couple years. And I've had mine for I think eight years now, nine years, something. Last year we doubled our revenue. So that was huge. But I think I'm just, I'm proud of learning, like how my business, like, from where it started to where it is now is so completely different. I've learned a ton and everything is like self-taught, which kind of sucks in some ways because it's like trial and error or it like takes you longer to figure things out. But even from where my business was last year, we are so much more organized. We have more systems in place. Things are becoming, we're able to automate things. Just like how it's come full circle, I feel like is, has been super rewarding. So we know that you write a lot. The question is, do you read a lot and not the books that you're writing? I'm assuming you're reading all day, every day, but are you a reader? And if so, have you read any good books lately? Yeah, great question. I'm usually reading a bunch of books at the same time. I tend to read a lot of fiction. So I listen to audiobooks and I read like chapter book, like novels, that kind of thing. Sometimes I do business books. I tend, since I'm doing so much writing in business, I don't always read those for pleasure as much as I used to because sometimes it kind of feels like work, but I love reading fiction. Good books. I'm trying to think. The best nonfiction book I've read recently is a Dan Pink book called When. Have you heard of that one? I have not. It's all about timing for when to do things. And I thought that was super interesting because it sort of made me think differently about my day and how I'm most productive and certain like times for when, just when to do things. Like, so one tip that I thought was awesome, they did like a study for when you should audition for things. Like say you're going up against a bunch of other people, whether it's an interview or you're an actor or a model or something, you're going for an audition, does it make a difference if you come as like the first person or you're somewhere in the middle or if you're towards the end? And they did this study through some kind of like vocal performance TV show where it's like the people who made it through to the next round. And they also looked at judges and sentences and what time of day people give out sentences for different, you know, hearings or whatever they're called. And it's not equal, which is totally messed up. But there were good tips for figuring out when you should interview. And the best time is at the beginning or the end. If you're the very last person to go, your chances are exponentially higher than if you're somewhere in the middle. Because if you're in the middle, they sort of, you kind of get lost in the shuffle. Especially if you're maybe an underdog or you're somebody that they're not expecting to hire or you're maybe not the person that what is most likely to get the job. If you go last, you have a better chance of getting it than if you go in the middle. Yeah, that is interesting. So I guess, how do you get yourself to go last? I mean, do you just show up, you stand against the wall, you take a three hour bathroom break and you just hope that the line has shortened? I mean, how do you, it sounds good in theory, but how do you bring that to fruition? If there's available time slots, pick the last day or pick towards the afternoon of the last option. So I've done that recently. So I do modeling on the side as like a side hustle. I've done it for like forever. But I started doing this with my audition time slot because they'll send something out where they're like, oh, you're going to audition for like Target or Starbucks or whatever these big companies. And you're going to see like their PR team or whoever. You don't know how many people they're seeing for this one photo shoot. It could be like a hundred or more. Like it could be a ton of people. And so when I look at the sign up dates, I always pick the very last available time slot. And when I started doing that, like I started booking more things in general, but I really feel like that helped a lot. (laughs) Maybe it was my confidence too, where I was like, I'm going to book this because I'm going to be the last person you remember. 
One of the things that's nice about being the host of the Beyond the Gnome podcast is not only do I get to have good conversations like this, I also learn a bit from time to time as well. So I'll tell you, when I go in for my next modeling audition, I am going to get the last available time slot. Absolutely. (laughs) Swimsuit edition, here we come. Good to know. All right. So with this portion of the Beyond the Gnome podcast, we like to get a little goofy from time to time, like to be a little silly. I noticed you're not sweating too much over there, (laughs) Amelia. So we're going to turn up the temperature. This is our lightning round. So just gives our listeners a chance to get to know a little bit more about Amelia, some of the peculiarities about yourself. We call it lightning. So you don't have to go into excruciating detail if you don't want to. But just a silly little way to end our time here together. If you could choose any person from history to be your imaginary friend, who would it, <laughs> who would it be and why? That's a super weird question. So they'd be my, I mean, couldn't I do that now? <laughs> but, well, any person from history. Well, I mean, unless you're really popular, I don't know if any former presidents would be your imaginary friend. I mean, would it be and why? I don't know if I have a specific person who I would want to connect with current people I think Michelle Obama is pretty awesome I don't know if I'd want her to be my imaginary friend but if I could like have lunch with her or something I think that'd be super cool there you go and she (laughs) just came out with a, a pretty good selling book not too long ago either if you could be on a reality tv show which one would you choose I don't know I watch a lot of cooking shows and I always think like, what would I make in that situation? It'd be awesome. Probably wouldn't be awesome at all. But yeah, some kind of like competition reality, something like maybe it'd be cooking. Maybe it would just be like random things like obstacle courses. I don't know. Lots of good stuff to choose <laughs> from there. See, I'm all about peanut butter and jelly. So cooking shows, not really my thing. Lastly, if you could eliminate one thing from your daily routine, what would it be? Waking up early. I do it. And I know I can't even say anything because you get up so much earlier than I do. But just like if I didn't have to experience the feeling of waking up super early, I feel like that'd be really great. Well, now what is super early? Are we talking like 10 a.m.? Is that super early for you? Something. That's pretty early. (laughs) That's pretty early. That's like not normal. Yeah. If I'm not up by 3.30 a.m. every day, I've overslept. So 6 a.m. is my lunchtime. All right. So, Amelia, obviously, you shared a lot of good stuff with us here today. It looks like Pithy Wordsmithery really provides a lot of valuable resources and services. Let's say somebody listening to this podcast, I got a book. God darn it, this motivated me to take that next step. If somebody wanted to get in contact with you, how should they do it? Yeah, you can go to our website. It's pithywordsmithery.com, just wordsmithery.com. And check us out there. We actually have a great freebie on the site right now. It's in the top bar, but it's 10 simple steps to start writing your book right now. And you can get that for free. It's super helpful. It's all the things that I found to be super useful working with different authors. So that would be a great starting point. And then you could also check us out on Instagram, pithy underscore wordsmithery. And then I'm on LinkedIn, Amelia Forzak. Well, Amelia, thank you so much for joining us on the Beyond the Gnome podcast. We really appreciate your sharing your expertise, and it was wonderful to have you on the program today. Yeah, thank you so much. It was fun. Thanks for listening to Beyond the Gnome with Paul M. Newberger. If you like our show and want to know more, check us out at stargroup.com. That's S-T-A-R-R group.com slash podcast. We're also available on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to podcasts.